I have felt God taking my hand through my grandmother in pretty much every interaction that I've ever had with her since I can remember. Um, she's been there to pray with me when I've asked her and when I've not asked her to. She will find some way to sneak God in there <laughs> and it's and it's okay. It's not uncommon. In fact, it's um, routine for people to come up to me and, and talk about how precious she is to them, how she has spoken into the lives of so many around her. Uh, God empowers me by being part of this family, just by the energy I feel once I get out of the car and come up the stairs and interact with all ages. We have our individual family, but this church is total family. I look around and I, see, I don't see isolation anywhere. And I think he made us with a desire for community. God knows that we all need each other. God made us with a desire for community. I think God's hardwired us, designed us for community. And you look at the Pena family, four generations, learning to walk together, learning through great times and tough times, how to encourage each other to, to follow Jesus. But it goes beyond that. Uh, for me, uh, growing up in a non-Christian home and becoming a Christian, I define my church family uh, as that spiritual family. And God gave people ahead of me and behind me to help me along the way. We're in this four-week series called Empowered by His Presence, and we're going to learn today that one of the ways that God empowers us is through community, through one another, and that if you come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you become part of a spiritual family, and God wants to strengthen you and help you along, and if you've not yet come to, to God through faith in Jesus Christ, God says, I can empower you, I can strengthen you through my people, through my church. So we're in this four-week series called Empowered by His Presence, and we're looking at the reality that we don't have to be powerful, and we're not powerless, but we should walk an empowered life. Let's look at the first of those. You're not called to be powerful in your own strength. You are not. Even though the world may tell you you're supposed to be, even though some days you feel like you're supposed to be, you know, this picture of, I climb the mountain by myself, I get up to the peak of the mountain, and I put my hand, I don't know why people get top of mountains, they do this, but you're supposed to do this. Hey, you know, you've seen the posters. That's what you're supposed to do, right? At the top of the mountain. And you're, you're, yay! And it's this person standing by themselves at the top of the mountain. No one gets there alone. But this idea that I should be powerful, I can do it all by myself, it's not a biblical reality. It's not the way we're supposed to live. But the other end of the continuum is also equally problematic. You're not powerless. You're not a powerless victim. And some people say, I'm in the valley, I'm beat down, I have nothing to give, I can do nothing, I just need people to take care of me because I, I'm kind of, I'm a nothing. I'm a powerless victim. That's not a biblical vision either. So you say, well, if the biblical vision is not that we're powerless, if the biblical vision is not that we're powerful in our own strength, then what is it? And here's the answer. We are empowered, empowered by the presence of Jesus when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, whether you're a Christian or not, this is the spiritual reality, when a person comes to the cross, sees Jesus crucified, understands that he died on the cross to take their sins, to wash them clean, and we receive Jesus, his death on the cross, his payment for sin, and his resurrection, we are washed clean of all of our sins, and Jesus moves in. The presence of the living God is in us by his spirit. And we're empowered strengthened every day by the presence of Jesus. We talked last week about the fact that one of the ways that Jesus, through his presence in us, one of the ways that he empowers us is through suffering, loss, and pain. The, the pain and struggle and hurt, and you say, well, I don't think I really want to be empowered through suffering, loss, and pain. If you weren't here last week, go online, listen to the message. Here's the reality for many, many people, if you talk to them, many Christians. If you say, when did you most profoundly experience the presence of Jesus and the strength of God. They will say, wow, it was in this time of tremendous loss or struggle or, or pain or sorrow, but God showed up in the midst of that time. 
So we shouldn't run from those times. We should understand that even in the most difficult times, God's presence is with us. We talked about that last week, that God empowers us in the tough times. Like the Apostle Paul said, when I am weak, then I'm strong. Because God shows up in powerful ways. But what we want to talk about today is that God empowers us, strengthens us, carries us through the journey of life, through community, through friendships, through family, through the church family. God wants to strengthen you and be present in your life through the people around you. And particularly, if you're a follower of Jesus, God wants to do that through other Christians. He wants to empower you and strengthen you through the people around you who love Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this amazing chapter of the Bible. And in this portion, the Apostle Paul is making a comparison between the human body that has many parts but forms one body and the body of Christ, God's family. Not just one church, but all of his people. Many parts, many giftings, many callings and passions. But they form one body. So I want you to watch in this passage the comparison of a physical body with many parts united as one and a spiritual body, many parts united as one. Watch this in the passage. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. There's the comparison, the physical body and with those who are in Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. That's true physically and spiritually. Verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye... Where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. That's true in your physical body. That's true in the body of Christ. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Well, our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And this is kind of a summary so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, help us understand this beautiful picture. That even as our physical body is integrated and connected and one, so we who have come and put faith in Jesus are integrated and connected and one through that faith. Help us understand that in this individualistic world that that pushes us towards isolation, that you call us to community, to beautiful, rich, life-changing, empowering community. Speak your truth to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Bible is filled with pictures of community. It starts in the very beginning, where in the very beginning, God creates, and there's a sense of God says, let us make man, us, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that God is eternally in community. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God models for us community in his very essence and being. He is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then he makes a man and a woman and brings them into community. And the whole story of the Bible is this picture of connection, of relationship, of community. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important of all the things that were ever said up to that point in history, through God and through his word, Jesus said, love God, love people. Connection, relationship. And so I want to give you today just two pictures, two biblical pictures that I hope you can lock into your mind 
And once those pictures are in your mind, you'll carry with them, those with you for the rest of your life. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you'll understand this connected life of community, and you will be empowered by God through the people he puts in your life. You'll allow them to empower you, and you'll let God use you to empower them. Picture number one is found in Luke chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn there. This is what I call lessons from a guy on a mat. You are on, you are on the mat or helping carry it. Or are you on the mat or helping carry it? I want to talk about a character in the Bible who was on a mat, had four friends carrying the mat. The story in Luke chapter 5 is a simple one. Jesus is traveling around from place to place, and wherever he ends up, he teaches. And at this point, he's in a house. So the house is filled with people to hear Jesus teach. And outside the house, there's people lined up to hear t- people teach. And outside the windows, and, and there's just no way to get in. And all of a sudden, along come these four men carrying a friend of theirs who was a paralytic who couldn't move himself, but they're bringing him because they want him to meet Jesus. Let's pick this up at Luke chapter 5, verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Jesus ended up doing more than that. He healed him. That man came and carried on a mat by four of his friends, and he went out walking under his own strength, God's strength in him, empowered for a whole new life. Here's the picture, and, and, and the passage goes on, and there's a fascinating conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. There's a lot more in the story. What I want to focus on is how this guy got to Jesus, his journey to Jesus. Four friends carried him. He couldn't get there on his own. They brought him to Jesus. When they got there, there was no way to get him near Jesus, so they did something very unusual. In those days, the, the, the roof in many homes were made of sort, of sort of sticks and boards and mud and grass, and they went on top of the house. There was normally a way to kind of climb up the back of a house. They went on top of the house, and they made a hole in the roof, and they lowered this man into Jesus. Talk about an aggressive group of friends. <laughs> I mean, they, they want their friend to encounter Jesus, and he was transformed by his encounter with Jesus. But here's the picture. Here is somebody in a time of need. And here are four people who have an ability to help meet that need. And you put those two things together, and something great happened. He got brought to Jesus, and his life was changed forever. I want to suggest to you today that you are either on the mat in a time of need, and you should let other people help you. It could be an emotional mat, a relational mat, a financial mat, a spiritual mat. It could be a health mat. I mean, it could be lots of different things. But in a time of need and struggle, you're either on the mat or you're in a place where you have enough strength to help carry somebody else's mat. Not by yourself, but in community with other people. And sometimes we're actually on the mat in one part of our life and helping carry mats in the other part of our life. You know, there's times where we're struggling in one area and we need help and we, and we humbly let people help us. There's other times where we say, but you know what? Even while I'm helping here uh, or I need help here, I can help over here. Sometimes we're on the mat and carrying mats at the same time. But what we're not doing is standing back and just kind of watching and observing and not relating. We're just, you know, we're saying we need to be engaged. We're either on the mat or helping to carry the mat. So I want to suggest two things to you. Uh, and, and so first, first this, there are times you're on the mat, humbly and thankfully let others carry you. The rest of the time, be sure you are helping lift someone else's mat. So if you're on the mat right now, if you look at your life right now and you say, boy, in this area of my life, I'm struggling, I'm kind of feeling beat down, I'm discouraged, and honestly, I need some help, all right? Don't be the powerful guy, the powerful woman who says, I can take care of it, I don't need anybody, I can handle this, you know, I can do it on my own, because that's not the way God's designed you to function, And if you come to faith in Jesus, you can do what I'm going to suggest right now. Three simple things. If you're on the mat in some area of your life, here's three simple things you can do. Number one, humbly admit your need. Just be humble. I'm powerful. I don't need anybody. No. Humbly say, you know what? I need a hand. I need some help. And the people that are around you that care about you, let them know. It baffles me. I've been a pastor now for almost 30 years. It baffles me that sometimes in the church, there are people who they will pray for anybody in need and help anybody in need. Then I'll find out that they ended up in the hospital, they had a problem, they had an issue, 
and they went through a difficult time, and nobody knew. And I'll say to them, why didn't you let us know? Why didn't you tell somebody that you were going through this? Oh, I, I can handle it. I can handle it. So you, so you want to carry everyone else's mat when they're, you want to pray and help, but you don't want anybody to help you. That's not spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity says I'm humble enough to say right now, I need some help in this part of my life. Number one, humbly admit your need. Number two, invite others to help. Can you give me a hand? Can you help out here? It'd mean a lot to me if you could come along, if you could pray for me, if you could help me with this, if you could encourage me in this, if you could keep me accountable here, if you could spend some time with me walking through this. Let people know what your need is. Humbly acknowledge it and then say, will you help? For some of you, that's the hardest thing you'll ever do because you think you're powerful. And you think you'll be weak if you can't live that way. That's not God's plan for you. He wants you to be moment by moment empowered, strengthened beyond, your, but beyond what you could do in your own power. And one of the ways he does it is through the people around you. Invite others to help. And number three, give God the glory. When God uses other people to lift your mat, Give God the glory. When that man, got, when his friends brought him to Jesus and he was transformed, he gave God the glory. So if you feel like you're kind of in a tough time, you're kind of on a mat right now in some area of your life, humbly admit your need, invite others to help, and when good things happen, give God the glory. And then, then when you get off the mat, when you're doing a little bit better, then you help carry someone else's mat. You now get engaged in helping lift someone else's mat. So if you feel like right now you say, you know, I got we all have challenges at different times, but you say, right now, I think I could help carry someone's mat. I think I could get involved in doing that. Three things for you if you want to get involved in helping carry a mat. Number one, notice needs. Just pay attention. Notice the needs around you. It could be at your school. It could be at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family. Notice the needs. Pay attention. If you say, I'm not sure what they're, I'm not seeing the needs around me. If you're part of Shoreline, call our church and talk to our care team. Talk to Pastor Dennis, talk to Jill, talk with that team, and say, and say, listen, I'd like to get involved in helping carry some mats. We have ministries for recovery ministries. We have care ministries. We have counseling ministries. We're developing a grief ministry, a divorce, divorce care. We have lots of care ministries, and we're developing more right now. And, and if you say, I want to help, I want to care. I'm not sure. I don't see needs right where I am, but I'd like to help. We will connect you. Because you know what? There's people right now who are laying on mats that need to be picked up. And we need people to be trained and equipped to help in that ministry. So part of it, just notice or contact us and we'll help you notice some needs. Number two, ask these words. Use these words. Can I help? Can I help? You see someone in need at your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. And you can tell they're kind of down. They're struggling. It's, it's a financial thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a relational thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a, they're, they're just in a tough time. You can see that they're down and they're kind of on the mat. And you notice you go to them and you say, can I help? And sometimes they're going to say this. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm good. No problem. I'm fine. Then I'd encourage you at that moment to look at them eye to eye and just say this. Really? Really? And at that point, if they say, no, I'm fine. Go away. Then, then don't force them. Don't pick them up. I'm carrying you. Um, just, you know, at, that point, it's like, you know, at that point, just give them the space. But you know what may happen? You may ask somebody, you know, I, I notice this is going on. And can, can I help? Ah, no, no. And most people say, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And you look at me and you say, really? Really? Because I'd love to help. Sometimes they're going to look at you and they're going to say, you know what? Thank you. And they'll just start to let you know how you can help, how you can encourage, how you can pray, how you can lift up part of their load and help carry that in some way. And so, and so first notice, second ask, can I help? And then three, pick up their mat in community. This is the beauty of this passage, is these four guys come carrying this man. Not one guy with him like over his shoulder carrying three people going, oh, I've got it all myself. They do it together. Because you know that if three or four or five or six people lift the mat together, it's lighter for everybody and you can get it done more effectively. This is why I love our care ministries, because it's done in community. We have a team of lay counselors. We have a team of caregivers. We have a team that does celebration of life services. We have teams of people, and we're building new teams all the time. And so come in community. And help lift someone's mat, but also don't do it by yourself. Invite others to be part of that ministry of caring for them. I call this the ministry of the mat, the ministry of mat carrying. And God wants that for us. If you need your mat picked up, ask, acknowledge it. If you've got strength to help carry someone else's mat, get involved in that. And a lot of life, you'll be having people kind of help carry your mat in one part of your life, 
And you'll be helping carry mats in another part of your life. And that's okay. But imagine, imagine this church, the thousands of people who are part of Shoreline Church. If all of us were willing to help pick up just, just a corner of a mat and help carry it, what a difference that would make. And imagine if we were honest enough to say, can you help me? I'm in a tough time right now. And give people a chance to also be empowered by the presence of Jesus. And, and the world would look on and say, oh, how those people love God. And oh, how those people, what? Love each other. Care for each other. That's the vision that Jesus has for us. That, that, that's why this picture, I, I think, is so profound and so helpful. And so I want to ask you just for a minute with me to think about this. If that paralytic, that man who was paralyzed, who couldn't get to Jesus, but his friends brought him, if he could stand here right now and just pour out his heart and say to us, if he could tell us, listen, understand this whole mat thing, get involved in letting people carry you or carrying people's hands, what might he say? Let's quiet our hearts. And I want you to listen to what I think his heart would say to our hearts today. Let's listen together. Fellow mat carrier, have you ever looked back and taken notice of how many times you were carried in this life? Parents and grandparents carried you and kept you safe. Friends have carried you emotionally and spiritually through rough times. People in your church who love Jesus have supported you and lifted your mat through prayer and care more times than you know. If you could see and recognize how often God has unleashed his power and grace as he lifted you up through the arms of the people in your life, you would be amazed. You would find yourself noticing people on their mats of loss, pain, loneliness, depression, isolation, crisis, or busyness, and your heart would break. You would want to help carry their load. Remember when you have been carried. Humble your heart and let others carry you through hard times. And let the grace and power of Jesus course through your soul and your arms as you help lift up people in their hard times and as you carry them to the only one who can heal and place them back on their feet. The powerful say, I carry mats. I help, I'm strong. But they won't let anybody else help them. The powerless say, I'm on the mat, everybody carry me. I'll never get off this mat. But someone who knows Jesus, who's filled with the Holy Spirit, they live an empowered life. And they say, there's times I need help, and there's times I can give help. Sometimes I'm on the mat, sometimes I'm carrying a mat. But I'm always in community, whether I'm being carried or caring. And there's beauty and power in that. That's the first picture I want you to lock in your minds. This paralytic, four people carrying the mat, and what that means for you if you're a follower of Jesus. The second picture is what I call lessons from Paul and Timothy, lend a hand. The second picture is how hands can be locked together for helping in spiritual growth and moving along the road of spiritual growth. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul points out four generations of spiritual legacy, of hand-locking, of helping spiritually along the journey of faith. And to kind of illustrate this, I've invited three people to come up here, uh, Roy, Zach, and Cole. And so uh, Roy's going to come up at the top of the stage here, and then Zach's going to go on the stairs, Cole at the bottom there. And I want, the picture I want you to get is this idea of generational help and strength and teaching. And so Roy, you lock hands with Zach, and let me see, let's go this way, there you go, lock hands there. And uh, Roy, pull him up the hill. You guys stay where you are. Okay, so, so Roy, here's the picture, okay? And you're not resisting, Cole. You're coming along, okay? You look like you're fighting. Uh, and so, uh, and so, so, here, so here's the picture. Stay right there. Freeze. Perfect. Okay, so here they are. That's what I like. Good. <laughs> look like the Roadrunner cartoons there, you know? Okay, so, so here's, the, here's the picture for you, all right? The Apostle Paul says, he's saying, listen. And so, so, you're gonna, so, so, so Roy is representing Paul. The Apostle Paul says, I've passed on. I've taught Timothy spiritually. I've helped him. I've grown him spiritually. He says, Timothy, I want you to take what you've learned. And what does it say? Pass it on to reliable people. So pass it. But then they don't, it doesn't end there, right? It doesn't end there. But it says that we'll be able to do what? What's it say? Teach others also. And the idea is not that it ends after that. 
So Cole, you reach out to somebody else. You're helping along. They're just right there. Good, Cole. Good, Cole. It's not comedic. Just stay focused, okay? Um, and so, and, and, and Roy understands. As a matter of fact, I loved in the video, Roy talked about how his mom was one of those people that took his hand and helped him along, and other people as well, right? And so the picture is, our whole life of faith is this picture. Here's the problem. Some people want to be powerful. I will help people up climbing the mountain of faith. I will strengthen people. I can, I can you know, lead a growth group, and I can help train, and I can help teach, and I can, and there's, and I can, can mentor my children and mentor friends, and, and they're, help, they're always helping. Here's the problem. If both your hands are reaching down the mountain of faith and always helping other people, at some point, what's going to happen? You're going to get exhausted, or you're going to get pulled down, and you're going to fall, and sometimes those people are going to fall with you because it's all my strength, Right? That's how powerful people want both their hands lifting people up. Those who say, I'm powerless, say, I'm at the bottom of the heap, and everyone's got to help me, help me, help me, pull me up, pull me up, pull me up. I got nothing to offer anybody else. Just pull me up, pull me up. That's not a biblical vision, neither of those. An empowered life. So look where Zach's standing in the middle here. This is a picture of an empowered life. (coughs) Imagine the strength in our spiritual lives if we always have a couple of people who are more spiritually mature, who are teaching, training, encouraging us in our faith, who have taken our hand, and they're helping us up our spiritual journey. But also, how much do you learn by helping somebody else as they're growing, right? And how strong do you become as you help them? This journey, this is the journey of community. This is the second picture I want in your minds. I want you to see your own life right now and picture yourself. Are you this person? I want to help everybody. Are you this person? Everybody's got to help me. Or do you walk through life like this, where you say, you know what? I want to be empowered by the presence of God through the community of his people. So do you have one or two people in your life who are more spiritually mature? They're further down the road. They may be older. They may not be older chronologically, but spiritually, they're helping you along. Hold on to their hands. Thank God for them and learn from them. But also, (coughs) excuse me, I'm going to, I'm back on. But also make sure that you're not just doing that, but that you're doing like what you see with Zach here, but you're also saying, I want to be involved in helping other people grow and bringing them along. That, that's called climbing in community. You walk through your life of faith in community with locked arms. So who's helping you along? And who are you helping along? Now I want you to listen again and just kind of quiet your hearts. And while you're listening, look up at these three and get this picture. So, so give us the Roy, you're helping kind of thing. And then, okay, so I want to... I want the picture there, and, and listen to these words. If, if Paul could come and say, and Timothy could say, this is what it's like, this is why this is important, listen to what they might say. Dear members of God's family, we belong to each other. We need one another. None of us can make it alone. We really are brothers and sisters in faith. The climb is steep, the obstacles are many, and the terrain is treacherous. Look at your right hand. Who is holding it? Who has God placed in your life to help you stand strong and grow to look and live more like Jesus. Grab their hand. Don't be prideful. Listen to their wisdom. Ask for their prayers. And let the love of the Father flow into your heart through them. These godly brothers and sisters are a gift. Look at your left hand. Is it full or empty? Who are you helping, supporting, praying for, encouraging, challenging, and keeping accountable? Who are you helping forward on the journey of faith? Keep investing in these people. Love them like a brother or a sister. Let the very power and strength of God pour from your life into theirs. Know that God has placed you in their life, and he intends to use you to infuse his blessing, grace, and hope into the life of another human being. What an honor. What a privilege. Don't take it lightly. So I want you to lock these two pictures in your mind. The ministry of the mat. Letting people carry you in times of need, carrying others, and being empowered by that community together. And then also, in a very real sense, in spiritual growth and learning. Make sure someone's got your hand. That you're not climbing the mountain alone. But someone's got your hand. And make sure you've got somebody else's hand. And you're walking in community, learning and growing. If we could do that, we would sense God empowering us. And I love, I love the, the gospel of Jesus. When Jesus comes and brings his love and his grace and his very life and gives himself, when, when Jesus comes to die on the cross, to rise again, to pay the price for us. And what he does in that process is he, he actually, as he walked on this earth, Jesus models and calls us to community. Jesus actually models community for us in many, many ways. 
And I, I, love, I love the picture of Jesus coming near the end of his life. <clears throat> he knows he's going to the cross. He knows his death is very soon. He knows that at that moment, all of the sins of humanity were going to be poured on him, and the judgment we deserved would come on him. It's a serious, heavy spiritual moment. So Jesus goes to this garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he'd been many times with his disciples. And he goes to pray and to pour his heart out to the Father and, and to fully surrender to this, this work of going to the cross. But I love what Jesus does. He goes to Peter, James, and John, three of his closest friends. And he says, come with me. Stay awake. Pray with me. And he goes deeper into the garden, and his friends go with him. This is God in human flesh who says to his friends, pray for me, stay with me, be with me. If God in human flesh wanted community and wanted prayer and support and encouragement, don't you think maybe you need it too? Right? And don't you think that you can empower others by offering that in their time of needs? That's the heart of Jesus, is to show us this picture, this vision of community. And so often we're tempted to just kind of say, I can handle it, I can take care of it, I can do it on my own. That's my tendency if I'm not careful. I, I remember the first sermon I ever preached over 31 years ago. I'd done youth talks and I'd done, I'd done messages of different sorts, but I never like, stood in front of a congregation and preached. And I preached my very first sermon. And when I was done with my sermon, the senior pastor, I was, I was an intern being trained, I was in seminary, the senior pastor took me aside and he looked at me and he said these words. He said, never do that again. <laughs> Which wasn't terribly encouraging. Um, <clears throat> And I didn't know what he meant. At first I thought he meant never preach again, which I felt really bad because I was really excited to preach. And, I, and so he clarified. And he said, he wasn't talking about never preach again, but he said, he said this to me. He said, in your sermon, you talked about your own struggles and how you don't fully do the very thing you were preaching about and how you were learning to do that and you hadn't really mastered it yet. And you just talked about how you weren't perfect in that, but you were learning how to live that way. And, and you really talked about your own struggles and frailties. He said, don't do that. He said, you're the preacher, and the preacher's supposed to stand up and be God's example to the people of how to live. And I'm like, I'm a kid. And, I'm think, and, I, and I said to him, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can stand in front of the church and say, look at me, I'm the example of all things. You know, at the time, I think I was 21, or you know, I think I was 21 years old. I, think, I don't think I am the example. I think Jesus is. So we kind of discussed it, and we kind of agreed to disagree, because fundamentally, I was trying to say to him, I, I don't think that I'm the example for everybody. I think Jesus is. And I've tried since then in my ministry to be able to stand in front of people and say, you know what, um, I, I don't have it all together. And some of the, a lot of things, when I'm preaching on some topic and I'm really passionate about it, it's because all week long God was just working me over <laughs> about that topic because I'm growing in that too. And so I've made a point when I preach to try, try to be honest and to say, when I'm, and when I'm on a mat, when I'm struggling to say to other people, I need your help. And about a week and a half ago, I went to our pastors. I sat our pastors down in my office and I said, you know what, I got to tell you all something. I'm looking at the next year at Shoreline Church. We have an amazing year ahead of us with ministry opportunities that are just mind-boggling. We're launching a whole new campus in Pacific Grove that will have its first preview service on Easter. I mean, this Easter, like 90 days from now. So that's going to take time and energy, and I'm going to have to partner in that whole thing. We're partnering with ministries right now all over the world, helping them, not just Carmel Press, we're helping with organic outreach, we're training them, but churches in New Zealand and churches on the East Coast, and we're having leaders of national organizations come to Shoreland and saying, will you teach us how to help our churches reach out and love our community? And I'm looking at all the opportunities, they're all good, they're all wonderful, but I'm going, man, I'm going to end up flat on my back, like on the mat completely, if I'm not careful. And so I sat with our pastors, and I said, I said to our pastors, I need all of you this next year to, to like help me. I said to him, I, I said, I'm not going to make it through this next year with all that God has in front of us if I don't know you guys are like, I didn't say pick up my mat or take my hand. That's I, I said, unless we're all working together, I need you to partner in this ministry because, and I just said, I can't make it through this next year if I try to do it my own strength. I can't. But if we climb in community, if we lock hands together, you know, if we carry each other's mats, we will be empowered to do things we could never do in our own strength. That's what God wants to do in my life. That's what he wants to do in your life. That's what he wants to do among us together. And when we are in that ministry of mat carrying, God is glorified, lives are changed. And I want to just finish by asking you just to listen to a couple people share what it's been like for them to have people carry their mat and to, to see the thanks to God for this great gift of mat carrying. Watch the screens. I 
thank God for the very special friends that we've developed through our growth group. They've carried my mat many times over the years because I've had serious illnesses and surgeries. They've prayed for me. One of the ladies does prayer walks. She walks an hour every morning and prays for me. Another time, my husband was playing golf with three other men from our growth group, and they decided to stop playing and just pray for me on the golf course. And many times, friends would ring the front door and just say, can we come in for a minute and pray with you? We just want to be with you and, and pray with you. And I can't tell you what that meant to us. Our friends in the growth group also brought many meals. They'd say, hey, I've just made a pot of soup today. I'm coming over. Or I've made a big lasagna. We're coming over and, and having it with you. And what a joy that was to have people come in when I couldn't go out and also to just bring in food, which helped my husband so much because he was my nurse, the chief cook and bottle washer, and, and you name it. But most of all, I see Christ in these people because they put their faith into action. It's not just words. They live it. And they have carried my mat literally when I was too weak to carry it myself. Hey, my name is John Brooke. I went through a difficult time recently when my job of 18 years was eliminated due to a corporate restructuring. I thank God for the men in my group, Horace Mercurio, Dave Federico, Tom Hughes, Ward McCalson, Ronnie Thompson, Scott Curtis, among others, who supported me, prayed with me, and helped me carry my mat. Without those guys, it would have been a much, much more difficult situation, and I thank God for Hi, Shoreline. My name is Kevin Clement, and I had a, an incident several weeks ago where I sort of passed out and collapsed and had to have some help from the medical community. I remember walking up to the counter and just sort of collapsing and looking around and everybody was Kevin, you look white as a sheet. <laughs> I looked over at Deborah and she was nodding her head, yeah, and says, he need help. And the people around me just, they just prayed for me and danced on me and helped me. And I'd just like, I'd like to thank Shoreline for, for helping them, for helping me clear, clear a hole in, in the roof and lower my mat down at the feet of Jesus. And he looked at me and said, Kevin, you're going to be all right. Now get in the ambulance. <laughs> you're going to be all right. Now get in the ambulance. Thus says the Lord. <laughs> I love it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that we don't have to travel through this world together. And we don't have to travel alone, but we have one another. Thank you that we don't have to be powerful and act like we have it all together. Thank you that we're not powerless, but that you want to empower us by your presence. And one of the ways you do that, God, is through the people around us. So help us to enter into this ministry of mat carrying and letting others carry us when it needs to be done. Help us climb in community with hands locked and lives locked together. Teach us as a church what it means to be the body of Christ, everyone belonging to the other. So when one member suffers, all suffer, and when one member rejoices, we rejoice together. Lord, thank you for a church that's learning how to be your community. For your glory and, Lord, for our good, we pray this. Amen. I want to invite our other venues uh, to uh, talk with their venue pastor and hand you off right now. And just one thing I want to say before you go today, and that is this Wednesday at 6.30 is Night of Worship. If you've never been to a Night of Worship, I just want to give you a personal invitation. You want to come and be there. If you've been to a Night of Worship, you're going to be there because you know that God shows up. It's an amazing time. But Nights of Worship, we share communion. We break the bread. We take, partake the cup together. 
We have extended time of worship and song, and we have extended time of preaching and teaching of the word. It's an amazing time of worship. It happens only once a month. And we kick off our night of worship this year, this Wednesday night. So please come, be part of that. And then also, if you want...